Yeah. Well, the multimedia uh, uh, for this year. Uh, talks, first up, so to speak. Um, and then we've got Douglas uh, talking about um, a, pro a programming aspect of GStreamer with uh, writing, uh, writing plugins, and that'll be at uh, 14.10. So on that note, I'll uh, hand over to Jan. Thank you very much. Talk is to give a uh, of, um, I'm Jan Schmidt. I am um, a GStreamer developer. I, I first started contributing a little while now. Um, for a large chunk of the last 12 years, it's been my full time job, and as of a year and a half ago, completely my full-time job. I started a, a company with a couple of other GStreamer core developers and we're full-time doing open source consulting around GStreamer and using the profits of that to feed back into the project. Um, I live in South East Australia on the New South Wales Victoria border and we, we live on a shed out in the paddock in a man cave that I've constructed um, out in a nice wide open and trees and things place to, to hang out and source software without too many distractions and the piece of software that I have on is, is GStreamer sure no not working well. So GStreamer is a multimedia framework that uses an abstraction of pipelines and basic building blocks connected together. Just finish clipping this on so I don't ruin the live stream. Uh, basic building blocks that we connect together and it kind of follows an abstraction of uh, electrical components that are connected together through their pads. So there's a super simple example pipeline there. You have some kind of source element. You feed it through a filter and then it goes to a sink. And so there's a, we have this pipeline description syntax that you can use for simple command line building. And there's, there's an example of that at the bottom. So you have a file source that will read from a file read an mp3 that we give it, feed it through an element that's called decode bin which automatically samples the contents of the file and investigates your available plugins and then selects a decoder for that and then feed it into the pulse sync that runs it out of pulse audio pipeline. That's kind of the most trivial hello world pipeline that we can build and then from there we have examples of pipelines with multiple thousands of elements in them for you know, 10 way video conferencing with video and audio streams per participant and signaling things going back and forth. So it goes from there way up. GStreamer is a completely open source project. We're LGPL and we rely heavily on other libraries for functionality so it's much more aimed to build on top of things and tie them together into a coherent framework. It's cross-platform and runs on pretty much any platform and architecture you'd care to name using a G-object based C API that is easily wrappable in other languages and so hence we have many bindings. GStreamer is not a media player, it's not a library for playing movies it is not a codec, it is not a protocol library, it's not a tool as such, it's not a streaming server, but it is used to build all of those things. It is a media engine on which you can build other, other applications. 
the goal is to have a really flexible design. You drop in a plug-in and then it can interoperate with all your existing other elements if you design your inputs and outputs correctly, which makes it easy to use both as an underlying application library, but also easy to integrate new um, application libraries into GStreamer. So, for example, OpenCV is a well-known open source computer vision library and it's fairly easy to take OpenCV operations, wrap them up in a GStreamer plugin, and then instantly be able to apply those to any source of video that you can that you can generate from any of our many inputs, or to take OpenCV and instantly turn it into an RTSP stream for people to watch online. And we have these days a nice ecosystem of consulting and support companies that are built around GStreamer. So there. Are, Many applications. Uh, I imagine that most of the people in this room have probably heard of GStreamer at some point. So some of this may just be useless background. But there is a huge range of applications and um, websites and uh, you know what have you that people have built around GStreamer these days. And every time someone does, it extends our abilities and. and um, makes for a, a more competent framework. So after 16 years of iterating on that, it's, I think GStreamer is quite a featureful and, and powerful framework these days. So, uh, yeah, 16 years we've, since the first release in 1999. And I think a, a sort of slow warm-up through those for that, that left-hand column of 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03 sort of experimental releases. And then the, the really interesting stuff, I think, comes around um, 0 0.8. 0 0.6 was the first version that GNOME started to use. 0 0.8 was the, the first one that I would consider we could start to play video reliably. 0 0.10 in 2005, it was our really, I think, big milestone release. We, we, rolled out 0 0.10 and said, from now on, we will provide an API and ABI stability guarantee that applications can rely on. And that was tricky to grow the framework's capabilities while still maintaining that, that level of API guarantee. But I think we did a pretty good job of extending that. So for seven years, we, we maintained 0 0.10 and it wasn't until 1.0 that we finally said, right, now's the time. There are too many things we got wrong in 2005. Now's the time to break ABI and API. And so 1.0 a couple of years ago was the first time that people really had to do any application porting for a new release. However, now we have 1.0 and it has its own API and ABI stability guarantees. So we... And currently, one and a half to two million lines of code, depending on how you count it, um, just using a quick overview of with slot count. So that's one and a half to two million lines of GStreamer itself and not at all attempting to count any of the, the hundreds and hundreds of libraries that it can depend on and compile. So it's quite a big code base to, to keep track of and wrap your head around. GStreamer 1.0, we've released in 2012 after a big, a, a long track of developing 0 0.10. We changed the ver versioning scheme, so from 1.0, you'll see it, our previous releases were 0 0.10, 0 0.10.1, 0 0.10.2, up to 0 0.10.36, and it was getting a bit silly, so with 1.0, we have a new, more commonly recognized versioning scheme that's a bit more like what the kernel does. So we have 1.0. A year later, we released 1.2. But in the meantime, there was 1.0.1, 1.0.2 that were only bug fixes. So we, the, the new way we do versioning is to do a major release number and then a series of minor things that don't add new features but only add stability so people can standardize a, a commercial application or a, they can target a single major release with a good guarantee that we're not going to break things by trying to introduce new features, only doing 
bug fixes from there. The difference between 0 0.10 and 1.0 in, in terms of application porting effort, we changed the internals of 1.0 hugely from what had gone before and added, you know, improved pretty much everything that we had put on our checklist of things we didn't like about 0 0.10, we rewrote. However, the external API changed relatively little, so the porting effort for people to move over from 0 0.10 to 1.0 is relatively small, and we've seen a good, good uptake uh, after two years of, um, of 1.0 releases of people moving their applications across. So certainly all the open source ones, uh, all your GNOME apps and things are all using GStreamer 1.0 now, so you're, if you launch Totem in GNOME, that's using the latest GStreamer underneath. But as someone who's working as a consultant, it seems like most of our business does come from companies that are using GStreamer for closed source products and don't want to move to 1.0 and would like us to do bug fixes in 0.10 still. We'd really like to kill that business off and um, persuade those customers that it really is worth moving over to what we think is quite a shiny new, less buggy framework. Uh, I have these graphs that I generate every now and then as kind of a um, internal check of how well we're doing in a, uh, as a project on, a, on just a couple of simple metrics. And um, so this is our Git history across all the dozen Git repositories that embody our GStreamer core and different plugin modules and, and whatnot. And you can kind of see a couple of uh, important inflection points in that graph if you if you look at it carefully. So 2005, that was all 10 or so of us core GStreamer developers at the time. We were working for Fluendo. They hired us and moved us all to Barcelona. And we were all in the same room together working on producing 0 0.10, and you can really see that productivity spike of commits the, at the, the second half of 2005, just before we released 0 0.10. And then kind of a more slow track, you know, it jumped, the, if you look at the average line, it, we jumped up and then we had a fairly smooth progression right up until um, the end of 2009, when we moved our project from CVS across to Git, and after a fairly long discussion about whether or not to do that and a migration process that, that took a while. And then there's a nice clear bump that shows just how good Git is at helping distributed projects um, work faster. You can, you can see that we immediately spiked up in the commit rate and that it continued to climb right up until we released 1.0. And I'm still undecided about what that downward trend from there means, but I might talk about that a bit more. After looking at a couple of these other, other graphs, um, is another metric of how many lines of code are we changing per month, and shows a fairly, I think, you know, a couple of bumps around those same 0 0.10 development points, but otherwise generally just an upward trend until we get to 1.0 and then slides downward again. The number of individual contributors that we're seeing, that's a, a nice a linear growth that doesn't really seem to be trailing off, which is kind of, I think, interesting to, as a way to measure how widely used GStreamer is. We see bug fixes and, and feature commits from a broader and broader range. So this is every month we see 40 plus individual contributors offering some kind of patch um, that's that's been accepted. And then one final graph of uh, dividing how many lines of code we change per month by how many commits we do per month to get a kind of monthly average. Uh, it shows this kind of interesting, completely flat line. So on average, we change about 100 lines of code every time we do a commit. Um, and I'm still trying to think about other metrics we might use for tracking the health of a project. I think Bugzilla stats would be interesting because I suspect if I go and graph that, we're going to see that um, 
one of the reasons that we've seen a slowdown in commit rate from 1.0 is that people are more tied up doing this old it's worth 0 0.10 and that'll probably be reflected in our bugzilla count slowly increasing as people have less time to look at bugs although we make a i think a, a herculean effort to to keep looking at our bugzilla and and push patches across so I have this question about what to conclude from our, our graphs about GStreamer. Are we doing less work since 1.0 came out? Has the work gotten easier and therefore the, the amount of effort required to do each commit is, is less? I don't think that one's necessarily it because still our commits are about 100 lines per change. So we seem to be still doing about the same amount of, of work on average per thing. Or is 1.0 just that much better that it needs less commits and less work to get to the same level. And I think to some extent that might be true, but I haven't got a definitive answer. But anyway. So recent things we've been doing recently in GStreamer. A big one that, uh, that we've, Centricular personally, have been involved in is um, Ericsson Labs have done a, an implementation of the WebRTC um, signaling protocols that they call Open WebRTC, and we've been helping them with with tidying that up and releasing that code. We have in, in 1.4, the 1.4 release of GStreamer, we integrated what was an external set of OpenGL elements and pulled those into the core set of plugins um, as well as the infrastructure that they use. And that's led to some uh, interesting developments in that we can now more easily integrate with platforms that are using OpenGL and GLES um, abstractions for passing data around. And a key outcome of that is we can now use hardware resources more efficiently. So in phones, particularly, or embedded devices, we, can, we have much better support for memory-to-memory um, -memory direct operations through hardware function units that hand you out a, a OpenGL texture ID or can map things into an OpenGL texture ID and we can do zero copy operations from capturing a pixel on the camera um, to putting it on the screen while simultaneously feeding an H.264 stream out of the things, you know, the things that mean your CPU can stay uninvolved but you can still use GStreamer to set up a, a pipeline that will transparently use software encoders and decoders where necessary but also use hardware where it's available. Uh, I have a quick demo. This one relies on the network, so may or may not may or may not work. We have to see. Um, so for some reason, I am now sideways. I don't know what that's about. Let me reload this page. Try and get it to maximise. And then I. So this is an, a, a WebRTC demo. This, on this side of things, I just have a web browser, and on the Android tablet here, I'm running a, an APK that has a GStreamer pipeline involved. And this one won't join. It's the problem with live demos, isn't it? So give me two seconds here. Oh, hang on, I have to click this. Yes, you're allowed to use the camera. I'm going to reload that and try that again. So it's still a little bit fraught because this is all, you know, that kind of code we've literally just compiled the night before out of the git repository that's my video there should be a second video feed that pops up from this guy though which is the bit that's not appearing uh, and it probably helps if i put in a session id
I will give this one more try and then we'll see whether this is I might just give up on this I did kind of have this down as a this probably won't work kind of demo because it relies on the network and network demos never ever work leave that running and check back in maybe Sometimes it takes a few seconds to, like a minute maybe, to establish the call, but I think this is just not working. But it was working when I was sitting up the back earlier before the, the talk. And what the demo does show when it works is that we have um, a Nexus 7 running a custom simple call example as a standalone app with GStreamer and Open Web RTC internals, and we can place a call between this device and that device across the network. Um, with this one being Google's implementation of Web RTC, and this one being our open source GStreamer version that they interoperate nicely. But this one will then be able to use any codecs you have available in your GStreamer install, not just what Google have, or Firefox have chosen to include, so it kind of gives a, that GStreamer flexibility to do anything with the, the incoming WebRTC. Uh, what else we have? So, yeah, that was the, the demo that isn't going to work, but I might try it again at the end. Um, LG took over WebOS um, from Hewlett Packard, and WebOS is a open source operating system, uh, Linux-based, with a, a custom sort of JavaScript web-based UI on the top and using GStreamer for all of its multimedia handling internally. HP had, the, had it released on their, you know, um, Palm phones and the touchpads and things that went out a couple of years ago, and LG bought that out, and then they've since been releasing WebOS-based TVs. So it's, you know, we're starting to see some interest from LG in pushing some of their internal patches upstream. So far they've just been a sort of silent consumer. We've also seen Samsung hire a dozen or so sort of, sort of GStreamer engineers around the world and pull them in to build Samsung TVs that are using GStreamer internally. So it would be interesting again to watch what's going on there. Um, we've had people working on HLS and Dash, which are uh, live streaming, uh, web streaming protocols that people like um, SoundCloud and Spotify and anyone doing HTTP streaming, there's a good chance that they'll be using HLS or Dash to stream their video out. And it's interesting in that it um, simultaneously encodes streams in multiple rates but batches and that you can switch bit rates anytime you reach the end of a fragment you can decide oh that one came in too slowly I'll jump down to a lower bit rate or that was streaming fine I'll jump up to a higher bit rate and so we've been working on our input elements for that about adaptive bit rate switching dynamically measuring how well you're doing with quality of presentation as well as supporting the trick mode operations that those can do where you play twice speed by fetching data fragment by fragment and then playing each fragment at twice the speed, skipping to another one and that, that kind of thing. Had been working on ESP retransmission, um, which is a portion of the RTP spec where you um, use your, you have UDP packets that carry your actual media content and you have an RTCP, TCP reliable channel for doing signalling back and forth and you can send retrans to if you lose an, a UDP packet. You can, also, you can just receive all of the incoming UDP but you can also use RTX to request retransmission of uh, things that are running, that, are running, that had, didn't arrive as long as you haven't tried to put that frame on the screen yet. And, but, so you can use RTX to optimistically try and fetch things that were lost while not bothering if, if doing so would make would arrive too late anyway. So 
it's kind of like you get a reliable channel enough to make your video work. It's and then when you have a lossy network, um, RTX can make a big difference in how well you manage to put the video on the screen. Uh, we have the PTV project that may, is our um, open source video editor that's based on GStreamer, and a couple of guys have really taken on PTV as their personal challenge, and they ran a fundraiser um, that's still an open fundraiser, although it has stalled out for several months. They're aiming to fund their own development efforts to bring a high-quality open source non-linear editor with a modern UI and access to all of GStreamer's processing and effects. Uh, and the, the work that they've been doing to push that forward has really driven some good pieces upstream. They're very focused on um, making sure that they have a reliable, reproducible app. So they put a lot of effort into doing validation and QA operations, that um, automated testing and things. So not, not even really working on the video editor, but working on the framework that makes sure that as they develop their video editor, they will know that it's rock solid underneath. And so that's in the GST Validate module. They've worked on a component called GST Aggregator that's about uh, improving the efficiency, reliability, and um, flexibility of our video mixing op and audio mixing operations. And that's gone upstream, as well as into the GST editing services module that's all about building a high-level API for doing video processing operations, because as a project in general, GStreamer focuses on very small building blocks, and so it's an ongoing work to try and build larger, higher level pieces of API that, that can hide some of those abstractions from application developers. Um, meanwhile, on the mailing list, we had a, an interesting email out of the blue um, a, a few months ago that indicates that soon our software will be in space. So that's kind of cool. Got, and that's scheduled to go up in the next month or two, I think. And that'll be kind of fun to watch that. Um, one thing that I have pushed on a little bit that is still an ongoing project is we have a, a network clock implementation that is kind of like our own NTP where you can synchronize operations across machines across the network. And I want that because the, the project that I showed uh, last year was my distributed media player that does a Sonos-style multi-room play-out system, and you, it uses the network clock to synchronize playback of audio streams across different machines that, are, that represent speakers in each room of your house. So it really relies on the network clock being nice and stable and, and reliable and, and accurate to get tight timing so that when you walk through your house, the stream that's playing sounds like a single stereo system and not like a stadium with huge offsets between the audio in each room. And the graph, I think it's a little hard, hard to see in this. They are both on the same scale. Um, there's kind of a before on the left and an after of the work that I've done so far. And this is kind of like an extremely bad example of the, a worst case scenario for our network clock implementation. Uh, in that I was, was measuring network clock synchronization across the network from here to my house with variable delays of anywhere between 70 milliseconds and, and 150 milliseconds or even worse spikes of packets getting lost in, for you know hundreds and hundreds of seconds at a time. And the before uh, shot kind of shows that even in those really bad circumstances, our clocking, clock tracking worked reasonably well in that we're sort of, um, that's minus 15 milliseconds at the bottom up to 25 milliseconds at the top. So we stay synchronized to somewhere in the range of 40 milliseconds. So within one video frame, it's, you, you're keeping these things synchronized even across an extremely bad network. On a local network, you can be in the microseconds range on my Wi-Fi at home, it's also quite noisy. For some reason, I occasionally see stalls on my home Wi-Fi of up to 700 milliseconds, and that can really 
throw out your measurements of something going on on the other side. Because it, the network clock basically does a ping pong. It send, sends a ping out and says, what time is it? It comes back and it tries to guess between when I sent it and when I received it. When did that guy tell me the time was? And it does regressions and things over time. Anyway, I've done a bunch of um, filtering and um, work on that that kind of gets rid of some of these larger spikes and in general it stays within, um, in, a, in good times, even on this noisy network where we're within 5 milliseconds plus or minus and at worst maybe 10 milliseconds plus or minus and that's tight enough for a quarter of a second. It's tight enough that probably you don't hear an offset if you're playing that in every room of the house. Um, but I think it can still be better because I would like this these swings across um, like 30 seconds it's going plus or minus 10 milliseconds and that's a little bit of harmonic distortion that you're going that a keen ear might notice in the audio playback or else it manifests as a, a click or a pop when we stop to jump in time so there's more work going on there um, another thing I've been doing lately is working on stereoscopic 3D video signaling so that we can handle 3D movies um, and I did if, if people are interested in any of that I'd go, my whole talk at the GStreamer conference in October was about 3D video support and what what's involved in, uh, in fully supporting that um, but I won't delve into it too far, I'll just do a little I just run a couple of demo pipelines. So here, for example, is a um, 3D encoded version of Big Buck Bunny, and it's delivered. Uh, sorry, this on my screen in front of me is a. Is that not going to go over the top? There we go. Okay, this is a 3D version of Big Buck Bunny. and it's delivered to you as a left eye and a right eye view. And one, so the, this is not normally how you need to output it, however, this is just, you know, an encoding and they basically just pack two frames together and then encode the video as normal. And in most cases, as far as I can tell, they don't give you any information in the file to actually signal that this is a 3D movie, even though the methods for signaling that are specified. So you get a 3D, you get a file, it has a 3D movie, but no one, nothing in there will tell you that. So you, we have to have API and UI for the user to be able to say reinterpret this. And that's why typically your TVs, at least the older HDMI 1.3s, they've got a button that lets you cycle through your 3D interpretation modes. Um, here is another, so this is another method of delivering content that is side by side encoding. Uh, this is not going to be great if it takes me that long to get it up on the screen each time. Anyway. So, uh, excuse me for a second while I fix my demo. We come across to here and then maybe this will pop up automatically where I want it. side-by-side -side encoding in the file and again no external information telling you that that's that but then so I've written some I've added extended our API so that we can add markings to each frame to indicate that it contains various um, packings of 3d content and then written some elements that let you translate that into different forms. So here it is as a the same file but now it's translated so that it's a line by line packing which is the kind of thing that you usually would need to output to a, a TV that has static 3D glasses. You at every alternate line on, this, on the TV is typically a left and a right with um, a filter. 
polarizing, that's the word I'm looking for, um, filter over the top for um, left circular or right circular polarization of, of each eye view. So it's not, you know, beyond that, it's not a very compelling demo. We take the top bottom, oh, so this is the other output mode that we can use with the rendering down to an anaglyph for your old school you know, 3D glasses and then you can put that on and see left eye, right eye. I've got a few if people want to grab them I can show you. So we can render that big buck bunny down and this is another it's where our new integration of OpenGL is useful because this is all rendered down to anaglyph using shaders and very little CPU, um, comparatively little. So it's chewing up one core to display that full 1080p times two. So software decode on this laptop and then funnel it out to OpenGL for, shade, for rendering down. Works, works quite well, but I haven't, that's not upstream just yet. I still need to polish um, and add more abilities. I still need that API that will let uh, an application specify that to override any interpreted input mode. Uh, we have had people adding a new, what time do I need to finish? Okay, cool. A uh, new device probing API that provides applications an easier way to explore um, the, the installed devices. And so far that's, uh, that's been mapped to find audio and video devices. So you can run the little GST device monitor thing and it will tell you that I have one camera and then it will enumerate the video formats that this camera can support and tell you that it's capable of outputting JPEG images directly at 30 frames per second um, and that I have a couple of audio devices, one for in, um, output, another one for outputting 5.1 surround and that I have one that's for input so you can capture from my microphone, capture from my monitor, so that's iterating the pulse audio available devices and so the, this new API makes it a lot easier for applications like um, Cheese, the, the camera um, camera booth style app for GNOME to locate devices to talk to um, without having to go outside GStreamer and start talking to V4L interfaces itself. We've also been focused a little bit on producing some higher level APIs, as I mentioned before, about wrapping up our smaller components and bundling them up into higher level APIs that people can build applications on. We've had a big focus on improving our QA. Uh, we've re reinvigorated our continuous integration system, so every commit to GStreamer now runs through a barrage of compiling machines and regression tests across all our architectures and platforms, which really helps us to, to track uh, introducing any, any problems um, across devices that not everyone has access to. Uh, we have a new tracing subsystem that lets you add fine-grained probes throughout the system and, and as you connect together these pipeline pieces, you can start to add tracing that will automatically collect information and say your video decoder is using 37% of your CPU but surprise, surprisingly you have a you know unexpected color space conversion going on and that that's wasting 5% you know, of your CPU and you can really measure those things with fine detail and optimize pipelines or debug them that way. Um, ties in with our GST debug a viewer, for, uh, we have, a, have long had a logging system that can run when you turn on our full debug of all categories and all levels then you, will, you can rapidly generate gigabytes of logs um, so the, they're kind of hard to find an individual problem that might have occurred you know 500 seconds into your pipeline execution, the GSD debugger helps with filtering down those gigabytes of logs to a usable form 
and, and discarding data. Or, um, and our GST validate that's come from the P2V guys, it's an automated regression set of tests for individual elements. So you can, if you create a new decoder, you can run it through the standard barrage of tests that the that GST validate has for, for decoders, making sure that they can negotiate different formats successfully. Or, so that's, that helps with making sure our elements behave uniformly. Um, and GST Harness, that's a, another test harness framework from the PEXIP guys um, in Norway. And all of this is being pushed into a new GST developer tools repository that we'd like to see grow. I'd, I'd still like to see a live debugger that everyone's wanted for quite a while where you can have a GStreamer-based application and connect to it over a TCP socket and then have it uh, have the ability to, to introspect all the GStreamer operations going on inside a process. And other things we're doing, an endless, seemingly endless task of um, bug fixes and maintenance that every time we finish doing whatever we want to be doing, there will be bugs in Bugzilla and patches from people that need to be shepherded and, and integrated. Um, we can always use more help with that. There's always new codecs and formats to be integrated, so um, H.265 and DALA encoders and decoders are things that we've seen added in in the last year and a bit. Um, there's KLV support, which is a standardised way of encoding key value pairs into DVB and MPEG-TS files, um, as, well as, so as well as KLV, so that should really be a subheading of DVB and MPEG-TS improvements. There's also been improvements in our MPEG-TS handling in general around measuring durations and being able to seek better inside those kinds of files. Uh, we've had Wayland support in a nascent form for a couple of years, but that keeps improving and adapting as Wayland comes along. So we have um, the ability to pass through encoded data to a Wayland server if it's able to decode on the other side of our connection or um, do synchronization operations with Wayland. V4L2 in the kernel has recently added um, API for dealing with hardware encoders and decoders, and so some of our we're seeing some devices come now with V4L2 exposed hardware decoders and encoders and um, memory operations. So it's now we've added support for doing memory to memory operations between those devices to again to pass stuff that you through a chain of, of hardware devices. We've got better support for mixing live feeds as they come in and and um, adding timeouts and handling late feeds better. If you'd like to get involved, there's a couple of good places to come and find us. We're in the hash GStreamer channel on the Freenode IRC. You can join us on our GST Devel mailing list on free desktop. Um, or you, you can come and have a look at our list of bugs in Bugzilla and on free desktop and see if there's something that you'd like to hack on. Uh, thank you very much. That's the current state of GStreamer. Does anyone have any questions? Good day. Um, just wondering what the sort of main challenges are for uh, 4K video and uh, ultra high frame rate and things like that coming through. The the main challenge is just purely the extra work that's required to, to handle them and making sure that the hardware can do it. Um, there's, no, there's no real magic to it. It's just making sure that our descriptions of codecs can scale to those levels, which in, in general they can. We can play 4K video. Um, but you, very, you, you, you find interesting things like um, you go and you look at your XV port, and you find that generally they go up to sort of 2048 by 2048 as a maximum. Oh, this one, look, I can go up to 16384 on this one. So this one, supposedly, I can pass it 4K video and it'll scale it and put it out. But you go to another piece of hardware and you'll find 
your output mechanism only wants 2K as a maximum sort of texture size or and the, those kinds of limitations are, are hard to work around. Um, I don't know what our OpenGL stuff would do if you pass it a 4K video. I don't know if it's smart enough to split it up into multiple textures and display them on separate quads. Um, there are a couple of other places that 4K crops up. Um, we've just, in the last week or two, Sebastian added support to our Blackmagic deck link driver um, plugin so that it can enable 4K modes on Blackmagic cards, and those are, those are the kinds of things TV studios use for passing 4K in and out on SDI ports. So we can do it from that level now and capture or output 4K through there. Only keeping the CPU up. And, and because we've done so much work to... The, the kinds of APIs that you use for handling this stuff, passing it through OpenGL and memory-to-memory -memory stuff so that you avoid touching your CPU and you avoid trying to do hardware decode and encode, we've done a lot of that work already. You can pass things through and then it's really about whether your system is able to deal with it or not. So the GStreamer can do the right things to avoid copying frames and wasting CPU cycles, but that may not be enough to get you there on, a, on any given piece of hardware. <laughs> um, in which case we just start dropping frames really. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any comment on kind of interoperation with the AVB networking standards for time video? No. IEEE 1722, that stuff? Um, no, I don't know which standard that is. Okay. Is that, that's Maybe it's not... time for a lightning talk. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it might it be. Is. I don't, I don't know which okay, type. Is that... start a conversation now. Is that PTP or is that... Uh, uh, like PTP and standards for the routers and everything in between to give right. guaranteed bandwidth and... Okay. Like on network. No, I don't know that anyone's done any work on that, at least in the open source. No, it's... Real. People may have done it privately. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your attention.